And now, as we return to Strathconnan, the Glen has emerged unscathed through Christmas and New Year, with no signs of bad weather. And the new owners have made heavy inroads on their deer numbers with heavy culling. But problems lie ahead. Just as Strathconnan thought it would escape with one of the driest winters on record, the rains finally come. And not only the rains, but snow and sleet as well. In early April, the so-called White Shepherd, lambing in the snow, becomes a grim reality for the remaining sheep in the glen. Although the new owners have got rid of the sheep on Strathconnan estate, Donald MacLeod, their one-time shepherd, still has his own ewes to lamb. Despite the weather, Donald's had a successful lambing. They did very well, the lambing, with me. I had 26 pair out of the 40 ewes. This is the last one to lamb. I've been waiting for her for the last 14. But I came down this morning, she had lambed. And she had difficulty lambing this lamb, so I'm giving, giving him a suck just now. In this, in this cold weather, if they don't get the milk, they don't last very long. There was one night I came down, had a pair of lambs in that field. I came down next morning, one of us away. The fox got him. I think this one will be all right now once he had a suck. And as hunger drives the hill foxes down into the glen seeking food, weather isn't the only problem facing the young lambs. I had a story too about a fox, he carries the lambs over his shoulders and the, the hair was worn worn on the shoulder of the fox by carrying all the lambs he used to carry back to the dens and he carried them for miles. He usually cut the lamb in half too, it's easier to carry and then they, they bury one half and go back for it again. Donald's fast growing pups are getting their first taste of winter and suffering their own share of hunger pangs. I still got three of the pups, two of them going off and keeping one myself. And I'm calling her choice. So another three or four months maybe I'll be trying her out to the sheep and see what kind of work is in them. Now the mother doesn't look near them. Heck, if they go near the mother now, she snaps at them. Of course that's nature, once they get to a certain age, the, the mother let them pen for themselves. And oh, it's quite interesting to see them at that stage. No, I don't like taking them out too early amongst the sheep. I like to leave the pups till they're fast enough to get ahead of the sheep. If you take them out too early, they seem to yap and yap after the sheep and they're more, more liable to catch the sheep rather than round them up. So I'll, I'll leave them for a few months yet before I take them out. But Donald has concerns of a more immediate nature, about the health of his wife Annie and about their very future in the glen. I'll be retiring age this back end and I would like to stay up in the glen here and I don't think the owners should be in a hurry to chase me out of it anyway, as long as I'm able to do some, some work for them. I'm trying to talk Annie over too, and she took a heart, a heart attack about a year ago, and oh, she said, oh, we need to move down here at a doctor or something. And Oh, I said, so, you can always get a helicopter behind the house here, takes you down there a few minutes to Dingwall, and actually oh, I think she'll settle down after that. <laughs> The late snow and lack of feeding is also driving the deer down onto lower ground. It's a dilemma for stalker Angus Cameron. He has drastically reduced hind numbers on Strathconnan estate in line with the new owner's culling policy, but still the deer numbers are high for the available food supplies. We're now killing up to 500 hinds plus followers uh, to try and get the numbers reduced, I think probably to about 2,000 head on the estate. At the moment, we're standing probably just under three and a half thousand head. Over a thousand stags of espian hinds and calves. So we had a fairly comprehensive count. We took a helicopter in and got all our neighbouring stalkers to come in. And we counted the whole estate. And um, we're standing still with numbers, really. We haven't reduced them any so far. 
But now there are concerns among the owners and stalkers from neighbouring estates about Strathconnan's policy of heavy culling. Although we are hard on them, our neighbours, probably with hearing we are killing quite a number, some of them are slackening off with their cull and there's possibly an influx to us of, of their hinds happening now through them not shooting so many. And although it's his job to carry out the new culling policy, Angus, a traditional hill stalker, has his own reservations about the large numbers of hinds and calves being culled. When I started off, we were more selective. What was needing shot was shot throughout the winter. Now we have to reduce numbers and there's no the same culling. It's more of a kill really to reduce numbers. After a while, that kind of gets to you a wee bit. See, you know, killing, killing every day. It's not what one is used to. Now, having failed to reduce numbers on Strathconnan because other deer have moved in to replace those culled, the estate authorises feeding to see the surviving stock through the winter. We've started feeding them again. We've, at first uh, they were left to their own devices, the deer, uh, when the new owners came in. Um, we've now given them hay in parts, uh, putting out uh, feed blocks for them. They weren't looking that good. Feb was an awful bad month. It's a crop that we're going to harvest, so we've got to try and look after as best as we can. Though the Glen's sheep numbers have been deliberately reduced, foxes have taken a heavy toll on the Glen's newborn lambs. Colin Henry, stalker on Scardroy, joins forces with Strathconnan's Angus Cameron on a joint fox shoot. Colin's daughter Diane completes the shooting party. Aye, that's right, Angus. There's deer over in the greens there. And so, what are we going to do now? There's a sand hole just in off the horizon, uh, below the high top over there, out of sight, and then there's a cairn above it. And then we'll come back into this cairn, as Angus says she was in there two years ago, was it, Angus? Right, uh, two years ago she was in it. So we got her in there two years ago. So uh, with a bit of luck, she might be in it this year. She's missed a year, basically. Each year after the young fox cubs are born, the Glen's stalkers join forces to visit known dens. If there is evidence of fox activity, they will return at night to shoot the vixen and any cubs. I've lived in Strathconnan all my life and it's a lot different from other places because of the distance I have to travel to do everyday things like shopping and going to school. It d does take a while getting used to. But I like Strathconnan, I wouldn't want to live around anywhere else. There's so much freedom and I get to do so many things that other people don't have the opportunity to do. Colin and his fox hunters check out the first den. So far, no luck. Here. Not much doing here either. Killing deer and pheasants and things like that. It's just something I've gotten used to. I don't think it's too fair on the animals, but it provides so many jobs. And if it wasn't for that, the highlands would practically be deserted. Meanwhile, Colin's sister, Mary Henry, the post bus driver, is on her daily round down in the Glen. We don't have the same snowfalls that we've had in years gone by, but you do have very cold temperatures. You can have ice, which is treacherous. You can meet some people who just are not used to driving on ice. And you might meet them on a corner or they're just going too fast for the conditions. There's a lot of deer can be on the side of the road. If it's bad weather conditions, bad winters, whatever, they can be lower down, closer to the road, all over the road. You have to be on your guard. They can jump out all of a sudden straight in front of you and you don't see them coming. I think in 14 years, I've hit one red deer and killed it. That was a shock, that was a fright. Mari's visits are especially welcome in bad weather for the elderly and housebound. Her daily journeys up the Glen include delivering groceries and medicine. Most people in the Glen have their own transport, but sometimes it's a long trek down the Glen to reach a shop. So they can order stores, supplies, goods from Marybank's shop and it can come up on the, on the postcard. 
I have your box of groceries there for you. And that's Thank your you mail on much. top. That's lovely. Hold, watch the wind doesn't catch that. Oh, yes. You you I'll yeah. get the door for you. Yeah, right door. Thank okay, you. Okay, then. Bye for now. Bye. Sometimes I take medicines up from the chemist shop in Bewley. Old age pensioners who don't have transport, so I quite regularly bring prescriptions to them through the week. Hello, Mrs. Hello, Fleming. How are, how are you doing? Not too bad. How are you? I'm fine. Okay, I've got your groceries here for you. That's very good. Thank you very them. much. Take that on your paper on top there. That's fine. Thank That's you. Very much. Cold, cold wind. <laughs> very cold. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. <laughs> Life gets no easier for the modern hill stalker as legislation protects more and more species previously regarded as vermin. All we're allowed to shoot is the hooded crows and the fox. The rest are all protected. Uh, the rest being eagles, sparrowhawks, peregrines, which can be heavy on grouse. But that's sod's law. We've just got to live with that. So the hooded crow is a lot to answer for, definitely. So we, we try to kill as many of them as possible. We don't have wild cat. The rabbits seem to have certainly decreased a lot in the last 20 years. A lot of this glens were full of rabbits, but now you hardly see a rabbit. Why that is, I don't know. Well, that's that. One sand hole looked up, nothing. Not a thing. And we come up through that cairn, we've had it in last year, nothing. So we've still got this place to look in over the top here, another big cairn. But there's a small sand hole on the other side of the barn, I guess. Ah, there's a sand hole there, I never saw it in no. there. Both this cairn that we're coming to, so it's just been in there. We've still to do the ground, you see in the distance, Karna. That theory down the loch on the left, left hand side, we had the problem uh, this year already with our fox killing lambs. Foxes will take uh, lambs for miles. Me pass handy lambs by to go to a certain spot and take lambs from further afield. Up here it's mostly lambs, there's a few grouse in it. Uh, an odd rabbit down in the bottom, but not a lot, not like other places, they don't have much else in this type of country. Colin and Angus are stalkers on adjoining estates, but though their landowners' policies don't always agree, they remain close friends. Colin and myself probably do think along the same lines. We've been at it all our life. I think the two of us are both third generation stalkers, so we have the same ideas. Nowadays it's different. The new owners are, they have their own ideas and, and uh, their aims are maybe different from the previous owners, so. Um, We'll see how that goes, you know. Dead as a tucket. Dead as a tucket, eh? Not a sign of fox. No shot Pretty sign of fox today. Pretty clean, eh? All round, really. Mm -hmm. No sign of a fox at all. Certainly this area is now clear for the time being. I might take a look at it maybe in July in case something comes in. You never know. And at last, winter is giving way to a reluctant spring. At Scatwell Lodge, his new home in the Glen, mineral tycoon Dennis MacLeod, assisted by daughter Kirsty, raises the salter. Kirsty, can you give me a hand here, please? Well, I always wanted to come back to the Highlands. Uh, there's no question about that. And really, it's, it was a matter of uh, waiting for the, the right opportune moment to do so. And technology has advanced so much in the last 10, 15 years, particularly the last 10 years, that it's now technically possible for me to sit here in this beautiful strath and conduct my business anywhere in the world. Everything that you'd ever wish is here. It's 30 minutes to, to Inverness, yet you, know, you wouldn't think so. We live in this beautiful remote glen, and it's 40 minutes to the airport, which is important. For me, uh, I, I fly a lot, obviously, and uh, there's about five flights a day to London, so it's, it's ideal. Dennis and his South African-born wife, Glynis, are keen to see that the local school doesn't go the way of so many primary schools in the Highlands. In the early 1900s, up to 40 pupils attended Strathconnan School. Now, after dipping as low as four, school numbers are on the way up again. 
Living in Strathconnen, nature lessons are an everyday part of growing up. Adders are very scared of you. It's only if uh, you stand in them, they defend. Mm -hmm. So they might have to bite you. The school up the Glen is, is of vital importance to this Glen and, and to, to the future of the Glen because after all without children in the Glen, the Glen will become a sterile place and, and I feel very strongly that in fact uh, that's, that school, albeit a small school, remains open. My eldest daughter goes there and my, my second daughter, Kirsten, will be going there shortly and uh, it's important to us because uh, the school is very much part of the community. Being such a small school, it's almost like having private tutelage. The children get an excellent um, education and there, there's, it's not just one teacher, they have a variety of teachers who pop into the school at various days during the week for art or religious education, sports. Um, so they're, they're getting an excellent education. At the same time, they're building up really good bonds with the other children in the school. The older kids take care of the little ones. and. Uh, there's a wonderful, caring, nurturing attitude between the big boys and the little girls and the vice versa in the school. And I think that it would be very difficult to try and take these children out of that community and um, send them elsewhere to school. And with the better weather has come good news for former rugby star Nairn McEwen. The Scottish Rugby Union has appointed him technical advisor and coach for the Highland region. Nairn's appointment makes him Scotland's rugby supremo in the north. His patch stretches from Shetland, throughout the Highlands, and out to Lewis and Harris in the west. Tonight, he's closer to home, coaching the improving Ross Sutherland team in nearby Invergordon. OK, lads. Now, um, I've watched you playing a couple of times, um, actually in Inverness there, and uh, what I think you, your continuity is not too bad but you're not running from depth and taking the ball fast. Well, I'm obviously delighted that the Scottish Rugby Union eventually decided uh, to appoint me as technical advisor for the Highlands and Islands because my main concern was that if I didn't get work for the union up here, I'd have to go away to Italy or places like that, which meant maybe the possibility of considering sort of not living in the Glen. Or, and I wanted to be beside my children when they're going through their schooling years. Uh, so it's a very important on my domestic side, apart from... Uh, I've been passionately wanting to meet the challenge of developing an area which I've lived in most of my life. In a rural area like the Highlands, it's much more suited to a contact sport or rugby. They have a bit more character. They probably have a harder life, a different upbringing. And I think they're eminently suited to this particular type of um, uh, modern warfare, if you want to put it that way. I know that this talented players up here who have that ability and grit and uh, endeavour to, to play the game. Uh, the potential is here and I'm very excited uh, about developing it. There aren't that many uh, coaches of Nairn's calibre um, around so if you get the opportunity to get that kind of assistance uh, you want to take full advantage of it and uh, I think it's going to be a big benefit to, to rugby in the north to have um, somebody like Nen coming around. It's a shame we haven't got more, more uh, people like Nen in the area to, uh, to really push rugby even further than it, than it is at the moment. You know. Get your rod, hurry up. Your last servant, die of. Come on. For Colin Henry and his brother Robin, the coming of spring signals the start of the new salmon fishing season. Should be a few, few fish in there, surely. Well, there'll be if there. there isn't, whether there we can isn't catch fish them or in not. There today, I'll uh, commit suicide. Uh, well, I wouldn't speak too soon. <laughs> <laughs> so come on, get organised. <laughs> come on, mind you, with an orange jacket like that, you scare every blooming fish under the sun. Colin's sons, Robert John and Colin Jr., have been fishing almost as long as they have been walking. It's nice to see the youngsters coming at it, making the effort, quite frankly. Not many of them get the opportunity, albeit that I would ditch that orange jacket, but anyway. <laughs> Colin is reputed to be one of the finest fly fishermen in the Highlands. He and Robin, a wealthy retired financier from Hong Kong, inherited their love of fishing from their stalker father. 
And my father was a very avid fisher and he was very, very keen. Um, and we just grew up with it. It was all part of us, basically, you know, growing up. I mean, hardly a day went by um, whereby, you know, during the fishing season, we weren't fishing. Have you seen anything? No. no. But they'll be there. Where I think I? probably with this sun, they'll have gone down a bit. Uh, uh -huh. Well, simply not in it, I'm afraid. It used to be very much in the old days, them and us. It was the owners and their guests and then the staff. And there was a very clear demarcation line between the two. And never the two should meet. But now it's a much more relaxed approach to the whole thing. As being a stoker's son, I was part of that lot and we were on that side of the fence. Now yes, we can come so. in and sort of hop across the fence from time to time. I'm not saying that we're on this side of the fence now, but uh, at least we can hop across the fence and be vaguely welcome. Did you see that fish? I didn't see that fish, Colin. If you've been mixing with people who have had toffee accents for the last 23 years, I suppose, um, it's quite difficult to ditch that. Well, anything doing? Well, they're not exactly plentiful, are they? I didn't see myself, quite frankly, as a stalker. Whilst I very much enjoy stalking, don't get me wrong, I could not see myself doing that uh, 365 days a year. And when the opportunity arose to go to Hong Kong, I seized that with both hands and went there, and uh, 23 years later, I've come back, having enjoyed Hong Kong thoroughly, working there and uh, playing there. Some people say that, you know, it's a fatal mistake to come back at all. Um, I, I would actually totally disagree. I go fishing, for example, uh, in Canada um, and also in Norway uh, for salmon. Um, and substantially larger fish, fish than you would expect to get here. But uh, frankly speaking, I prefer to be here. Today, nothing is biting, but there will be other days, other pools to fish. Robin rents shooting from Dr. Murdoch Lang, Colin's boss on Scardroy Estate. Yes, but it's dropping now. Robin hopes Dr. Lang's river improvements on Scardroy will eventually allow him to rent fishing too. But then, how will Colin know which of his two bosses to please? Dr. Lang tells him one thing and I tell him another thing and then he tosses a coin and <laughs> see which way it comes down. <laughs> On balance it works out quite well actually. Now, let's see if we can get a little bit across here. You have one? Well, we've got something going on here. You better come in out of that. Yeah. Oh. Bit, of, bit of pressure on him. You can he back seem, into the air. He seems to be just in this rather dead bit of water here. I'm a little concerned about this leader. Keep him coming. Yeah, yeah. There, you are. there we are. Well done. Right. Oh, he's quite a he's quite, quite a reddened up fish. He's quite coloured. <sighs> well, he didn't arrive in the river yesterday, did he? No. See, we got the one good one. I think we can afford to let this one go, can't we? I'll hold him for a little while. Here he goes. Right, well. Okay. That wasn't you bad, manage the I'll rod. Say. I'll yep, get the fish. I'm fine. Will you take the fish? Sure. Good. Right. Great. Thanks, Colin. Very good. Well. Well, that wasn't a bad day's work altogether, I think. Not really? Too bad. Two Not fish bad. on the upper meg at this time of the year. <laughs> The snow is clearing from the high tops, the hill burns are in spate, and the run of spring salmon is battling with a river suddenly come to life. And Strathconnan itself comes to life in a majestic late spring. <laughs>